Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Barry Asman. I want to welcome you to this webinar. We are just a couple minutes early and we'll be underway momentarily. Thank you so much. So um, it looks like we are ready to go. And I want to welcome everyone here to this uh, live webinar brought to you today by Insight. I want to thank Christopher Butler and Doreen uh, Holmes for setting this up and making all the arrangements. Uh, it's great to be here. And I hope everyone is staying healthy in quarantine and keeping with local social distancing requirements. And it's just it's great to bring Dave all the way from Manchester, United Kingdom, and have him share a few words with the guys. Maybe maybe a little more than a few words. So, uh, interestingly enough, uh, I believe the connection today was established when Dave and I had the opportunity to visit Rhode Island College back at the end of October 2019, and it was because of a specific parent of a a uh, child who happens to follow Dave Steele and enjoys Dave's extraordinary poetry was that was the catalyst that brought us uh, up to Rhode Island back in October, you know, 2019. It was a tremendous experience, and um, I'm happy to uh, bring us back to uh, New England today. So, um, Christopher, I w again, thank you for all your, everything on your side. Is there anything that you would like to um, share, speak? It just it's it's great to have everybody here. I know that a lot of our clients and staff and friends are really struggling during this time, especially with isolation and feeling very depressed. And it was Doreen's idea. Doreen uses Dave's poetry to start our monthly positive outlook meetings. Um, so the folks in those meetings, a lot of them are on the on the call today, are familiar with Dave and his work and. So Doreen thought it would just be a way to add a little positivity in this world that's, that's not full of a lot of positivity lately. So, you know, we're just really excited, Dave, to have you here today, all the way from England. And, um, yeah, thank you. So. Excellent. Thank you, Christopher. So, Dave, uh, without further ado, I give you Dave Steele, the blind poet. Thank you, guys. And uh, thanks for everyone that's kind of attending today, uh, although it be virtually. I'll uh, get to see all your faces uh, as we go along with this now. Uh, Barry normally does some kind of housekeeping, which we'll kind of get to in a minute. But yeah. um, the way I want to kind of let play this out, I know there's going to be, as uh, as Chris Niffer said there, there's a lot of people that are kind of familiar with the poetry as you use it in the groups and know a little bit about my story. And some of you, I presume, would have seen me and heard my story when I was there in October. And I'm going to kind of, for those who weren't or aren't too familiar, I'm going to kind of do a brief uh, backtrack and go over uh, the basics of my story and how I've become to be known as uh, the blind poet as it's uh, as it's been recently and uh, and how I started to write the poetry uh, and what I'd like to do from this session as well is to make it as interactive as possible as Christopher said there correctly uh, in these uncertain times at the moment everyone's feeling isolated not just those affected by disability or low vision but um, our families and, and everyone around the world is 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 kind of going through a lot of the feelings and emotions that a lot of us will go through uh, even before this pandemic. So um, I think we, you know, it's good to kind of talk about that. Um, um, before I do that, and before Barry goes over the housekeeping, I'm going to share a poem with you straight away uh, because it, it fits in exactly with what we were just, just talking about. A couple of weeks ago, uh, some of you may know, we did a webinar where we invited people to speak about the same kind of subjects we're going to be talking about today. So talking about how we are getting through these days, how we're dealing with uh, anxiety and isolation, how we are coping with having to social distance when we do go out and what those kind of emotions are, uh, how they're affecting us and how they're making us feel. Um, and when I did a webinar a couple of weeks ago, we talked about all these things. And from it, I, uh, I wrote a piece of poetry uh, on how everyone was feeling and to kick things off for this I'd like to share that poem with you now it's got no title it's yet to be in a book I've only read it a couple of times so I'd like to kind of debut it with you guys right now and it goes like this I hope you can all relate in times like these we all can feel a little more alone 
the whole world's isolating, our anxiety has grown. A virus sweeping coast to coast that none of us can see. It's time we pull together, though apart, let's still be we. We all can play our role in helping others who feel low. Our mental health is vital when we've got no place to go. But keeping social distance, staying home, all that we can, is saving lives. Let's stop the rise. This is the only plan. Let's use all social media, connect this world wide web with all the things that people need till waves of sickness ebb. So let's never forget that together we can cope. I'm sending out my rhyming words, this poetry of hope. We've won our independence, we can do it now once more. Whilst living with low vision, we've been trapped behind this door. I know there's plenty out there who like me know how it feels when things out of our control are independence steal. When all of this is over and the virus is no more, let people come together like they never have before. Too long we've been divided by the things that shouldn't count. Let's learn from our mistakes. Let's be kind in large amounts. There we go. Thank you, Dave, for kicking things off with that beautiful piece of poetry. And, uh, you know, when we first talked about, you know, doing, how do we interact? How do we bring people in? How do they share their emotions? Uh, that was the culmination of that webinar and, and tr tremendous, tremendous, tremendous job. So I just want to go over a, a couple of things here. Uh, it's possible many of you are already familiar with the Zoom function. Um, if you are, just bear with me here just a moment. Um, but what we will do is Dave will go in, he'll talk, give his presentation, and afterwards we will open it up for Q&A. So there are two ways to um, get our attention, and I will be monitoring the uh, these these different these two avenues. One, there is a Q and A button. Uh, depending on which platform you're using, you will see you will find it. Whether sometimes at the top, sometimes at the bottom, but there is a Q and A uh, option. You can send in a question there, and then we will read it, and Dave will answer. You can also send a message through the chat. We will monitor the chat, and then the third option is that you're, there is a button to raise your hand. Now, if you raise your hand, we will also give you the opportunity to come into this mix as far as the video, so you can be together and talk to Dave with through video if you would like. So, um, if you're too shy, uh, you can send a, you know privately the question through Q and A through chat. If you want to get involved with video, raise your hand, and we'll bring you in as a panelist. And I encourage everyone to be interactive, Absolutely. not to be shy. Yep. This is a friendly environment. We're here to, uh, you know, have good feelings and positive thoughts. So, um, Dave, take it away. Sure. Okay. So um, for those people who have never met me before or know very little about my kind of poetry or my story, I'm going to share with you a kind of abridged version of what I'd normally uh, speak at these events. And of course, what I told when I was there in Rhode Island uh, back in October. So my name's Dave Steele. Um, I am from Manchester in the UK. You can tell by the funny accent. And I have a condition uh, which I'm sure a few of you will be familiar with uh, called retinitis pigmentosa or RP for short. So for those of you that don't know anything about RP, it's a hereditary condition. So it generally kind of runs in the family. There are lots of different variations. Uh, to this day, there is no treatment or cure. And the way uh, most people tend to lose their sight with RP is it starts off with night blindness. And with night blindness, what I'm talking about for those that don't understand or don't know, it's like um, basically struggling in low light situations or struggling between um, bright lights to dim lights. So for example, the average person walking from an outside environment into a, div, a dimly lit, lit room will sometimes take a couple of seconds for their eyes to adjust to the light. Someone with night blindness will not be able to adjust and will not be able to see in kind of dimly lit rooms or like cinemas and, and places like that and tend to kind of trip over things or, 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 or stuff like that. Um, then the next kind of stage of RP is you start to lose your peripheral vision. So they almost call it, they call it tunnel vision. So it's like a tunnel closing inwards. And then once you lose all your peripheral, you then start to lose your central vision, which in, in a lot of cases results, it results in total blindness. Um, so the way I kind of see at the moment is uh, my left eye is completely blurred. I can't see out of that at all. And my right eye, 
I've lost all my peripheral and I've got about three degrees of my central vision left. So it is pretty much like looking through a straw, but I can still see faces. Um, thank God. I can still read text if it's large enough. Um, I use zoom text on my phone and tablet and things like that. And uh, I can fairly get around. Okay. I use a cane. I have a guide dog who's not with me at the moment. He's out having a walk called Christopher. And, uh, and yeah, um, that's where I'm at at the moment. But my story started pretty much around about six years ago. In fact, it was six years ago last week. We had the anniversary of when I was first diagnosed. Now, I knew I had RP in my family because, as I said, it's a genetic condition. In my particular case, it comes from my mum's side. My mum is completely blind with it. I have a couple of sisters with it. Um, and then uncles and aunts and things like that. So with the, the specific type that we have in my family, because there are lots of different genetic mutations of RP, my particular gene type is what they call autosomal dominant, which means there's a clear trace in my family. Every time a child is born, there's a one in two chance that they could develop RP. Now with the particular type that I have, it normally doesn't show the first stages, which is the night blindness, until your late teens, early 20s. So when I was a kid, I kind of grew up normally, um, wasn't affected by it whatsoever. I first found out we had RP in the family when I was about seven, eight years old. Uh, my sister was the first one to be diagnosed with it in my immediate family. And um, I didn't really hear much about it other than that. I kind of grew up fairly normally and was always told that if RP was going to affect me, it wouldn't happen until I was um, uh, you know, very old um, and uh, it was nothing to worry about. And I kind of just got on with things. Uh, and that all kind of changed around about six years ago. Uh, I went for a routine eye test. I used to get myself checked every year or so just to make sure that my eyes were good and I was still okay for driving and things like that. And I went for a routine eye test. And when I went into that appointment, they looked into the back of my eyes and the doctor, the optician said, um, there seems to be a lot of pigment in the back of the eyes on the, on the retina, which is the main kind of sign of RP. And he said, we need to refer you to a retinal specialist, but you need to kind of stop driving straight away because we think it's deteriorating fairly quickly now. So the minute I walked out of that optician's room, my whole world kind of changed. And I'm sure those affected with low vision that have had that diagnosis will recognize these kind of feelings. I told my fiance, who was waiting for me in the room, who's now my wife, Amy, and she was waiting outside uh, the optician's um, office with our at the time six month old son Austin we just um I just proposed to Amy we were just saving to get married the following new year I proposed on the Christmas day I always proposed on the Christmas day and got new we're getting married on the new year's the best way to not forget an anniversary that's why I did it um so yeah you know we I walked out of that room told her broke the news to her that um I was being referred and I had to stop driving and that was the moment my whole world changed. What followed was a very, very dark time in our lives. I was diagnosed as being severely sight impaired, which is legally blind by a retinal specialist about a week later. Uh, I told my employer because I was working in car sales at the time. And because I couldn't drive any longer, they let me go. I was also working as a singer and I couldn't do any of my, my shows, my gigs anymore because I couldn't drive to get to them. So I had to stop that. And for the first sort of six to eight months, we really, really struggled. We lost um, the house that we were staying in because we couldn't afford the rent anymore uh, because of me not working. We applied to get support through the benefit system and there was a nine month waiting list for that. So um, we got to the stage where we had to feed our kids on food parcels. All the while I was rapidly losing my sight very quickly. I lost all my peripheral within about six months of that diagnosis. I was, feeling anxious for my sight loss and I was also feeling depressed and anxiety due to the financial pressure that I was putting on my family so as I said it was quite a dark time but we were really struggling uh, as a couple myself and my fiance Amy at the time who's now my wife grew closer together because she was determined that we'd still go ahead with the wedding on New Year's Eve because she wanted me to see her walk down the aisle uh, and we just did it on a budget she made a lot of the things herself, but everything kind of changed just before we got married in the November of 2014. What happened was my sister, who was the first one to be diagnosed, um, advised me that the best way to find support, like you all know, 
is to speak to other people who are going through the same thing. Often when you get a diagnosis, whether it be done, you know, for low vision or any kind of, you know, life changing event, it's often done in quite a cold clinical way. Uh, so the best way I was advised to get proper support was to speak to other people going through the same thing. And I, I found that through some of the online support groups on Facebook. I joined a few RP support groups and started speaking to people. And through that, I got invited to go to a support group meeting, face-to-face -face group meeting for people with RP, my condition, and another condition called Usher syndrome, which I know there's a few of my Usher friends out there today listening and, uh, and, and, and watching, um, which for those of you that don't know anything about Usher, it's um, death blind. So the same sight loss, RP, uh, uh, in the sight loss, but also with sensory hearing loss as well. Now, when I got invited to that meeting, they'd heard that I was a, a singer, that I'd worked as a singer for the best part of 20 years. So they asked me if I would be the entertainment for the support group for the day. So I thought, absolutely, I would love to do that because I was feeling quite underconfident. I always say to people that when I started to lose my sight and went through that early stage, I went through a lot of the things that people with uh, a low vision or a diagnosis tend to go through a loss of confidence, a loss of independence, a loss of pride to a certain degree. Uh, but the biggest thing it took for me was my purpose. I didn't know what I was going to do next. I didn't know where my place was in the world. Everything I'd done had involved me getting around independently and driving. So that was a big change. So when I got asked to sing at this event, I immediately said yes, because being on stage and speaking and singing in front of an audience, that was always my comfort zone. So the night before the event, I was in bed and this is where everything changed. It was one of those kind of eureka moments. I was in bed, my wife or my fiance at the time, Amy, was trying to get to sleep and I was going over ideas of songs to sing the following day. And I had this idea where I thought uh, if we could take a song that everyone knew, but change the words so it would have more of a, an impact, more of an emotional response. So I chose the song Stand By Me by Benny King. And the reason why I chose the song is because I love the opening line of when the night has come and the land is dark and the moon is the only light we'll see. Because that to me was like night blindness. So within 20 minutes, um, I rewrote the song. I called it Stand By Me RP. And I'd like to play you a tiny bit of it now. And you should be able to hear this. Let me see, hopefully. Can we hear that, Barry? Good. When the night has come and the land is dark and the moon is the only light we'll see. No, I won't be afraid. No, I won't be afraid. Just as long. As you stand, stand by me. So darling, darling, stand by me. Oh, stand by me. Oh, stand now. Stand by me. Stand by me. If your eyes could see how I'll become, I tunnel so close. All your love ones, faces fading, not to see. Please don't cry, just see your cry. And let me your hand, for together we will be this, this our peace. I'm going to stop it there. Um, so for those that couldn't really hear it clearly, the, 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 there was two verses and they've changed the chorus and the first verse that you just heard there was if our eyes could see a world become a tunnel so closed all our loved ones faces fade in not to see please don't cry just say you'll try and lend me your hand for together we can beat this rp and that kind of describes how a lot of people uh with low vision and, and particularly with rp felt about their journeys and when I performed that song, 
the, uh, the, the day after I wrote it at the event in Newcastle uh, for people with RP and Usher, that was when I found my purpose again. When I rewrote that song that night, it took me 20 minutes to, to rewrite those lyrics and change the chorus. And I knew instantly that it was going to take me on a journey. I remember saying to Amy as she was falling asleep, I've just had this idea and it's going to change everything. And she just pretty much just said, shut up, Dave, I'm trying to sleep. Um, but the following day when I sang that song, people were coming up to me um, in tears and saying that I was able to describe how they felt about their journey with low vision and it helped them feel like they were less alone. And that struck something in me because it made me feel like I could do something to help people. So from that moment, I started to write poetry because music and poetry are the same thing to me. They're all lyrics. And um, the best musicians and, and singers and songwriters to me are storytellers and have that ability to heal the heart and touch the soul in a way just speaking to someone, you know, can't possibly do. So um, I started to write poetry every single day, sometimes two or three a day, about everything that we were going through as a family, good days, bad days, everything. I wanted to bear my soul and not hold anything back. And I promised that I would do that. And every time I posted the poem onto one of these support groups, people would message me from all over the world saying the same thing as those people in the room did that day when I sang Stand By Me RP. They would say that I was able to see into their minds and, and into their hearts and describe how they felt. They felt like they were less alone. They were then using my words as a way to communicate to their loved ones, to their friends and their family, how they felt um, when they couldn't find the words themselves, they would use one of my poems. And every time I got a message like this, it healed me as well. It helped me come to terms with my rapidly declining vision. So that was November when I released that song. Uh, I put it onto YouTube. It started to go viral. I started to post the, the poetry onto the, onto the Facebook pages. Myself and Amy got married on the New Year's Eve. And then I just started my own Facebook page, which I named after that song, Stand By Me RP which has now become one of the largest support groups in the world for people with low vision and RP. And it just really snowballed from there. Uh, it's been nearly six years ago since my diagnosis, I said last week, five years since I started writing the poetry. And I've written over 700 poems. After about a year of writing from when me and Amy got married, I had over 100 poems. My Facebook page was continuing to grow. I was continuing to get more messages from people. And uh, my confidence in what I was doing was starting to come back. People were messaging me suggesting that I should write a book. I should put my poetry into the book. So some supporters of mine started a GoFundMe campaign. And with the proceeds of that, in February 2016, uh, which February is RP Awareness Month, for those of you that don't know, uh, we released the first book, uh, Stand By Me RP, which I have here. And um, that book there uh, became the number one European poetry release on Amazon in both America and Australia in its first week, uh, which completely blew me away. And to top it all off, when the book was released uh, in February 2016, on that day it was released, I was on the way to go and celebrate with my wife and our son, Austin. And the phone uh, rang, my cell phone rang on the way, and Guide Dogs UK, the charity, called me, to let me know that they'd also matched me with my first guide dog on the first day my book came out as well. So it was a complete emotion overload. And it kind of just continued on like that. And Barry will, when we talk about this, Barry will testify to this. This journey seems to be one of these things where when you're in the right place at the right time and you're helping people, things it's almost like things happen for a reason and i'm a great believer in that i'm a believer that everything that we go through in our lives whether it be good or bad gives us the ability to manage our challenges going forward um so you know that's a big thing so um stand by me rp came out in um february 2016 i'm going to just read you one point from that right now and then i think we'll kind of get a little bit more interactive before i tell a little bit more of the story um, so this one is the one that I generally start off all of my talks with and the reason being is I came out to America and I'm going to give her a big shout out now because one of Barry's patients, a lady by the name of Barb Calhoun, who has Usher syndrome, heard this poem from my first book. It really helped her turn her life around when she was struggling with her diagnosis and she reached out through this poem and she was the catalyst that 
put me and Barry in touch and, and, uh, and started this whole America tour off. Uh, so this is called My Blind Secret, and it goes like this. I have a secret from the world that most of you don't know. Won't hear it in the way I talk, and eyes no clue will show. If you listen to my story, something new to learn you'll find. For though I'm looking straight at you, I'm legally blind. It's not a simple yes or no, I'm more a shade of grey. I rarely venture out alone as things get in the way. For what I see affects my days in much more ways than one. And this for some continues until little left has gone. But still as pain's invisible to those that passes by. There's some afraid to hold a cane because of questions why. Accused of making up our claim and made to feel a fraud. Feel drained of all my confidence. Feel trapped behind this door. Now hardest thing to come to terms that makes my days feel long. It holds us back knowledge they lack for all who've got it wrong to hear their judge and jury even though their facts aren't straight feel misdirected fury which opinions now could wait to take the time to get to know the visions that we share come join me in my tunnel hold my hand and show you care there you go barry any questions uh well we don't have any questions yet but uh if anyone wants to raise their hand we want to come into the into the mix here uh, now would be a great opportunity. Again, if you're feeling a little shy, send it through the Q&A and we will go ahead and read it out. Um, While we're and, waiting on some know, questions, I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll, read, I'll read one more poem quickly. Uh, and this is the kind of thing, you know, that Christopher kind of alluded to at the beginning of the call that I really want to touch on within this, as well as telling you my story and, and reading some poetry. Uh, and we've talked about this a lot recently, but I, I think it's worth bringing up again on this call. And that is that, um, you know, with everything that's going on with the pandemic at the moment, um, it, it does feel almost like that the whole world has stepped into the world of your average person who is living with disability. They're dealing with social anxiety. They're dealing with isolation. They are dealing with uh, all, all kinds of worries and, um, you know, worries for the future and worries for tomorrow which a lot of us will be familiar with. And what I found is a lot of the poetry in my books um, really kind of, although it's written for people with low vision, there's a lot of people who have never been affected by disability or low vision who are really relating to a lot of these kind of subjects at the moment because um, it's very familiar to us all. So I'd like people's opinion on that. Um, I'm gonna read this one before we start taking some questions and bringing people in, hopefully. Uh, this one's called Together. Let's the glasses off and I'll look a bit blurry. One second. And it goes like this. I long to see the faces of the people that I love. I long to see the beauty of the stars from up above. To watch our children playing on a beach of golden sand. No matter what the challenge is, we'll face it hand in hand. Though sights forever fading and the details fade to blur. I know together we will be. That's one thing that I'm sure. I hope one day they find a cure, so once again I'll see the sparkle in your eyes when you are looking back at me. But I won't waste a moment, not holding out for this. Although sometimes I think about the beauty that I miss, I'm still a lucky man, I'm grateful for my life. For in my strong embrace I'll hold my children and my wife. Don't need all of my senses for happiness to share. I may not see your face, but I will always know you're there. We'll make each, each day a moment. We'll sail across the sea. No matter what blind future brings, together we will be. There we go. Excellent. So we do have a hand up, and I'm going to be bringing in Doreen Holmes as a panelist. So Doreen will be coming in here in just a moment. Let's see if this is going to work. Okay. Here we go. And we'll unmute you. Doreen, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? We certainly we can, can hear you. Play, can you see me? Uh, we do not see you. You might have your camera turned off. There's a little button normally if you click it and... I just sent you a link to ask you to start your video. There you go. There I am. I'm in my nice. office. Hi, Doreen. Hi, Dave. And I'd just like to say a big, big thank you for, uh, for basically, you know, making this thing happen. And um, uh, have you got your T-shirt on, by the way? Is that, is that a, a blind poet T-shirt? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> no, thank you so much. It's um, it's uh, you know, an honor to be here and talking for you guys again. I want to thank you, Dave, for doing this. Um, our struggles here at Insight are the same as yours. Um, the ones that are not totally blind, we get all the time. You don't look blind. You don't act blind. Sometimes I, I make a judgment call and say, should I react to this or not say anything? And then I say, I'm going to speak up for those that can't speak up. And mm -hmm. I was getting on the ride bus and it's a bus for, you know, disabled or um, elderly. And there was, I was at the beach and I was walking up to the bus and this woman said, I hope she's not getting on that bus because she's not elderly and she doesn't look disabled. So I said, should I say something or not? I turned around and I said, for well, your fact, I am half blind and I am elderly. So she goes, I'm so sorry. I said, you should speak, you should think before you speak. Um, but you don't know whether to make that judgment call to say something or let it go. Yeah, it, it's difficult because, you know, first of all, I think you've got to kind of take a step back and go, it's not actually um, their fault because it's just a lack of awareness and a lack of education. No one's to blame for that. Um, there are plenty of other disabilities out there that I know nothing about. Uh, but I think, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head there saying, it's about not judging and not coming to conclusions and, and simply asking. Uh, but you, sh you certainly shouldn't criticize anyone in public and, 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 and leap to the wrong uh, you know, impression. And, but it's, it's something we do all face. Mm -hmm. And I was talking about this on a call the other day. Uh, I was talking about uh, mobility aids. One of the biggest things that I find and one of my biggest challenges and battles that I really try and talk about every time I speak, and I'm sure a lot of people are going to relate to what I'm going to say now is, there are too many of us out there, and I know this is going to strike quite close to home for some people who are listening. There are too many of us out there who uh, won't take the help that's needed because they feel like they don't fit into that perceived box. Now, let me explain it a little bit further. So many people will say to me, oh, I'm not blind enough to use a cane yet, or I'm not blind enough to have a guide dog yet. And I say to them, well, you know, do you find yourself not going out to certain places because it's maybe too dark or too busy um, and you find yourself staying home a little bit more than you used to? And they go, oh, yeah. And I go, well, you're ready then. Um, don't think that you have to have a certain level of vision to use a cane or to use a guide dog. I can still see faces. I can still watch TV. Often when I'm out with my guide dog, Christopher, people will come up to me and say, oh, are you training him? No, he's my guide dog. Oh, you don't look blind. And we're back into that whole conversation. Yes. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a common thing. Um, but, you know, what my biggest advice to people would be not to get angry or upset about it unless someone's being rude to you um, because, you know, I, I can't abide rudeness. Uh, and remember, you know, in a lot of cases, it's just a lack of awareness and a lack of education. Uh, but if you feel comfortable enough to speak about it, great. If not, then, um, you know, you don't have to do that, um, but you shouldn't have to explain. People should be a lot less judging. Um, and that's one thing I really hope coming from, from this pandemic at the moment is, and I mentioned it in that poem that I read right at the beginning about, you know, learn from our mistakes, be kind. Um, I hope that because a lot of us are dealing uh, with, you know, anxiety and isolation, you know, people that have never had to deal with it before. I think, I hope, hopefully, touch wood, people will come out of it a little bit more kind and understanding. Mm -hmm. True, true. And when I lost my license, it was the worst day of my life. Yeah, it's a big thing for a lot of people. I tend to, I found that um, it was a really big thing for me when I lost, my, when I was told I couldn't drive anymore because I've got a daughter, Ellie, who you may know about by a previous relationship who lives in Glasgow, which is like a three and a half hour drive. And I used to drive up and get her, bring her down at the weekends. And I couldn't do that anymore. Now my wife, Amy, does it. So I miss driving. And so it was a huge thing for me at the beginning. But after, because of all the other things we were going through, it kind of um, didn't feel like it was as important as, as it did at the beginning. There were other things that were more important um, that I was more concerned about. You know, my children have a one in two chance of losing their sight. 
uh, because of the type of RP that I have and, and there's, you know, different things and emotions like that. So driving kind of fell away in the, right. the list of priorities. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. I'll, I'll continue on while we're waiting for more people to, to come on. I've just seen a little chat there. Was that Bailey Barnes I saw there uh, on the chat? Yes, it uh, is. Yes, oh, it is. Do, 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 do you remember who Bailey is? I, I know who Bailey is. I'll tell you from singer. Texas. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd love to hear what Bailey's saying. So let me uh, just read, actually. Uh, Bailey uh, wants me to read this. When Dave, it goes to you, Dave. When you're faced with people that are rude or impatient, how do you show them grace and not react negatively? <laughs> it's difficult. I think we all face that challenge. I'll be completely honest. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't. It just depends on how I am. We are all only human. It happened to me, as you well know, Barry, when I came out um, to America for my tour with you guys in October, November last year. Uh, in fact, no, was, yeah, it was then, actually, yeah. Um, I, I Normally, when I'm at here, I will go to the gym. I normally go to the gym weekdays. Obviously, not when we're in lockdown, but in the normal world, I'd go to the gym in the daytime and I'd use my cane to the gym. And then I'd work my guide dog, Christopher, in the afternoon. If I'm at events or going into town or to a meeting or something like that, I'd take my guide dog. When I came over to America for those three and a half weeks or whatever it was, I was using my cane everywhere. And I was going through places like New York. Uh, you had me, you know, going through Penn Station using my cane. And, and it was <laughs> a proper crash course of, of, uh, of, of, you know, using my cane. And even like going to the airports and flying, it was a big nervous thing coming over. So when I got back uh, just before Christmas, I felt super, super confident. I felt like ninja level cane user. And I went to, um, we have here in the UK, Christmas markets. So what I mean by Christmas markets is um, in Manchester uh, city centre at Christmas, they do it in a few other cities as well. But in Manchester city centre, they have like wooden um, huts and they sell like, hot chocolate and lots of Christmassy kind of food and lots of German sort of traditional food and mulled wine, which is like a hot alcoholic winey drink and, and lots of Christmassy stuff. And it's very, very nice, but it's very, very busy. So I went there with my wife in Austin and uh, took my cane and I was walking down a street, quite busy, trying to get fight through the crowds using my cane. And there was a group of young guys walking towards us. Amy and Austin were behind and one of them looked at me as they were walking past and shouted out, he's faking it. <gasps> and they were gone past me before I had time to react. Amy was behind me and she shouted at them. And I looked and just saw my son Austin, who's six now, his face. And he was kind of, why are these guys shouting at my dad? And that really upset me because I was like, can't I just go anywhere without my sight loss being, and I feel myself getting choked up talking about it now, can't I go anywhere without my sight loss being um, a cause for something, stress, anxiety? Um, so, yeah, you know, you have moments like that, but then, you know, I've just got to kind of, in answer to Bailey's question, take a step back and go, it's just lack of education. Um, and it's natural to get angry. Uh, and no one should be shouting at anyone in the street for anything like that and, and making comments. Um, but I'm, I, I'm not going to let it stop me from going out as much as sometimes it makes you feel like I can't be bothered with the hassle of going out facing these things. You can't let it beat you. And I think that's one of the things, the biggest lessons that I've learned through my journey is uh, as I call it, learning to breathe while I still grieve. Um, I know that the anxiety that I have still to this day, in certain situations is, comp is perfectly normal and natural and the hardest part of it sometimes is and we all do this we all get frustrated with ourselves and we beat ourselves up for it and we get down on ourselves and the trick to it is to take a step back realize that these things and these feelings are perfectly normal and natural and that they will pass just like everything else and pick yourself up and carry on don't let it stop you <laughs> That makes sense. Yes. And I think that's what we've all got to do at the moment. I think we've all got to kind of, this is where I feel like we can really excel in these kind of times. I know there are people, as Christopher said, right at the beginning that are struggling out there, but if you just remember and realize that how far you've got now and all the things that you've got through to, to this day, 
all the challenges that you face and what you survived the the best way if, of dealing with any of this stuff which is what i talk about in my poetry and why it kind of resonates with people it's about dealing with things in small chunks not worrying about the future too much knowing that it's perfectly natural to do that but just sort of seeing the beauty in each day and um not waiting for a cure or you know a treatment just dealing with all the, the things the good that we've got um rather than just focusing on the bad but when we do focus on the bad don't be too hard on yourself Mm -hmm. anything else coming through or would you like another poem? Uh, no no let's, let's go for another poem let's do that so uh, well, I'll, I'll continue a little bit of my story so uh, the bridge version first book as I said Stand By Me RP came out in February 2016 and then I released volume 2 um, Stand By Me RP um, in 2017 February again for RP Awareness yeah, by the way by the way Dave I don't know if you can see well, Doreen has all three volumes. I've seen uh, that picture before on a book film. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay, sure. And signed as well, I believe, from when I was in Rhode Island. And okay, then book great. three, Stand By Me RP <laughs> Volume 3, came out in February 2018, and they all were number one releases on Amazon. And that's kind of, you know, where I'm sort of at now, but a little bit further along since you guys last saw me. I speak at events here in the UK and obviously in America as well. And my poetry has grown and grown and grown. People use it as a way to feel less alone, as a way to explain to their friends and family how they feel. And, um, you know, I'm so proud of hearing the individuals, uh, the individual stories um, out there, you know, from the people that are there in this group now, from Doreen, from J Janice, from, um, from Michaela. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's, it's amazing. Um, what I do want to share is, I've got well, a, few, a few things. So as I mentioned, and we've talked about, I came out to America in October, November last year for my first USA book tour. We toured all the way across the East Coast and I came obviously to Rhode Island College. Now, something happened at Rhode Island College that I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you a story of now, which some of you may know because I spoke about it when it was there. But for those that don't, this, I, this, this series of events that happened at Rhode Island College is something that I have spoken about at every event ever since. Um, so a few, a few of you may be surprised to hear about this. So what happened was we had uh, one session in the afternoon at the college and one session in the evening. Both sessions were doing the same thing, an hour presentation, telling my story, reading some poetry, and then a Q&A, and, and then a book signing, selling the books. And at the end of the first session, while I was doing the book signing, I noticed a, a young gentleman in the room, a guy in his early 30s, looked like he'd come straight from work. He was wearing like a high-vis jacket, uh, looked like a kind of a workman on the road. And there was something about him that was drawing my attention. I kept staring over at him. He looked kind of out of place, but there was something about him. Eventually, he came up to me while we were sat at the, uh, uh, while I was signing books. And he said to me, well, I said to him, my name's Dave, pleased to meet you. Um, you know, what's your name and what brings you here today? So he tells me his name, not going to mention it now for, for obvious reasons. Uh, but he, he says, um, I was just diagnosed with RP on Monday. And this was Wednesday, I believe. So I was like, as soon as he said that, I was like, whoa, okay, right. Just do me a favor, come over here. And I took him away from the table and I sat him down uh, on a table so we could talk away from the crowds. And I started to ask him about, you know, what had gone on. And he said to me that he thought he had cataracts and he'd been advised to go to the opticians and they looked in the back of his eyes and they saw the pigment, same as my story. And they said, we think you've got this thing called RP. There's no treatment or cure. You, your children may have it as well. He's got three children. And this happened on the Monday and he was, he was there with me on the Wednesday. And I was like, wow, I said, that's, that's incredible. I said, you know, first of all, really sorry to hear that. I can remember how it felt for me quite clearly. How are you feeling? He said, one minute I'm angry, next minute I'm sad. I'm going through all these kind of emotions in a very short space of time. He said, but that's not the strangest thing. I said, okay, what is? He said, well, what happened was, he said, when I left that opticians, I went home and the first thing I did was I jumped onto my computer and I researched RP, retinitis pigmentosa. And one of the first things that came up was one of my poems. 
and he read it and it kind of really resonated with him. And then that day on the Wednesday, he was in work and his wife out of the blue called him up and she said, you're never going to believe this, but Dave <laughs> Steele is in America. And not only is he in America, he's in Rhode Island. And this guy walked straight out of his work, jumped in his car and drove straight to come and see me. Oh. And when he told me that Oof. story, I literally had goosebumps all over me. I, I, was, I was crying. I hugged him and we've kept in touch ever since. And that happened um, at Rhode Island College. Thanks to Joanne Alga, who organized the event with, with the guys at Insight. And um, to what are the chances to talk about fate and things happening for a reason of this guy just being diagnosed with RP, uh, finding one of my poems online, being helped by it. And then all of a sudden, I, I just happened to be there. Um, which was just, it's just crazy. But yeah, what, I mean, what you were there, Barry, what was it like for you? Uh, it, it was, I was just going to say, I remember as if it happened literally an hour ago, I remember this young gentleman, you know, slowly creeping up, waiting, trying to get your attention. And I remember it just exactly, literally word to word, the way you explained it. I remember you going over to the side. And then after you had wrapped things up with him, I remember you came, you came, over, came running over to me. He's like, Barry, you're not going to believe this. I'm like, what? And you share that story, and I literally, I could feel the hair, like the goosebumps yeah. as well. It was just incredible. Like, what, like, what are the chances, you know, Dave, you know, from Manchester United Kingdom, being in the U.S., being in Rhode Island, you know, mm -hmm. that specific day, and um, you know, I guess you know, everything happens for a reason. So, it was, this was meant to be. From the well, exactly, and I'm a great believer in that. From the moment this journey started, and and once again, Barry, you'll attest to this. When we started that tour in October, when you were there with our good friend Lanny D to meet me at the, at the airport. Um, it just seemed to happen like that. Right place, right time, th the way things kind of snowball. We got invited on that tour to go and speak at a, um, well, no, no, not even to speak actually. We went to, we got invited to attend a uh, Veterans Day uh, Memorial concert, Veterans Day concert in Baltimore uh, through uh, the amazing guys at BISM blind industry services in maryland and they invited me to be like a guest there and a couple of days before they asked if i would be happy to read a poem so without any hesitation i agreed to do that and during the veterans concert i went on stage in front of 500 veterans all marines in full dress uniform and read a poem for them and got a full standard ovation from 500 of your amazing armed forces, which just sent chills through. It was one of those moments that I'll never, ever forget. The poem that I read, I'm going to read for you now. It describes everything about my journey, my whole story, why I do what I do. And it's a very special poem. I think even Barry's got part of it on the wall at the office. Is that right, Barry? Yes. Uh, yes. And, um, and yeah, this one will always stay with me. I actually wrote this poem uh, as a acceptance speech for the first ever award that I won, which I just happen to have here, actually. I've got them. Um, which is, it's uh, from a charity here in the UK called Henshaws, who are over 180 years old. They uh, support people with low vision and a whole range of other disabilities. And they gave me an award uh, called the Impact Award for the impact that I've made within the blind community. And when they asked me to... Uh, accept the award uh, I tried to write a speech couldn't so I wrote it in a poem uh, to explain about why I do what I do and this is a poem that I read for you that day I read at the um, veterans concert and I'm going to read for you now and it goes like this all the tears that I have shed and these scars upon my wrist have made me who I am today prepared me now for this I wouldn't be so strong if I had never failed before I'd still be isolated, scared to step outside my door. I'm not saying that I'm over this. Those bad eye days still come. For even now, whilst reading this, I'm blinded by the sun. I'm anxious and my chest is tight. I feel like giving in. But deep inside my heart, I know I'll never let this win. I promised just six years ago when blindness certified, through poetry I'd share my tale to others far and wide. So no one ever need to feel alone with losing sight, explain their thoughts to loved ones through these verses that I write. But never did I imagine that my words could do so much. 
They have healed the hearts of strangers, opened doors with slightest touch. I'll be a friend, my pride will mend, my purpose clear to see. Three books will be my legacy, my stand by me, RP. I know that soon these faces that I look upon today will disappear, but I won't fear. These memories will stay. My wife, my sons, my daughter, in here will never age. My love for them is printed in each poem, verse and page. When last is gone, I'll carry on to make my family proud, to be a voice for others, to help them lift this hazy shroud, inspire them to grab a cane and step outside their homes. Four words, each poem's message saying, you are not alone. <laughs> there we go. One of my favorites. Yeah. So we have, um, I'm going to bring uh, Bailey Barnes is coming in to the chat here. Hold on one second. Doreen, I'll keep you in here as well as we welcome Bailey. Okay. How are you, Bailey? Good. How are y'all? Hey. Good. Good to see Hi. you, Bailey. You too. I'm trying not to be shy here. <laughs> no, don't be so, no, no, I appreciate you coming on. Um, and what I'd like you to do, if possible, um, is can you explain how we kind of met? Oh, yeah. I've Well, I wanted to, first of all, just say thank you for that. I guess I should explain that now. Um, so my nephew, uh, how many years? I think three years, two or three years ago, he was diagnosed with RP and and we don't have it in our family at all. So we are all clueless and um, started researching a lot and it was extra hard on my brother and sister-in-law because they're, they don't know how this happened. They're feeling like they're at fault for something. And, and it was just really hard, a, a dark time for sure. Um, but we met you and we joined the Facebook group and um, you wrote him his own poem. And that just really gave us a community and we were able to learn so much and get perspective and i could not be more thankful for that really so thank you for everything that y'all are doing and your words so no you're, you're, you're welcome and brayden is uh, one amazing uh, young guy he is and and you uh, and, and your family have been you know fantastic support to my work and, and my poetry uh, in, in return um, for those that don't know, I'm going to kind of embarrass you a little bit now, Bailey. Um, Bailey is, I, I, to this day, one of the most amazing singers I have heard in my entire life. Um, she doesn't like that she lacks the confidence with this, but I swear to God, Bailey has got one of the most incredible voices. Your, your brother, I remember him contacting me and saying, oh, my, my little sister's a singer and she's got like some songs on YouTube and stuff like that. And uh, she, uh, if I send you one, you should have a listen. And I, I get kind of stuff like that mentioned to me, you know, uh, often about uh, singers and I kind of take it with a pinch of salt and I said, yeah, send me a clip, I'll have a look. And uh, he sent me this clip and I was like, oh my God, um, this girl is, my wife Amy, she says it all the time, she, she'd win American Idol, like oh, her man. eyes closed. Uh, but, you know, I think you're too good. I, I think you're too good for it. Um, but, you know, if you ever get, get the chance, uh, in fact, I'll post a video, Bailey did, you, you took some of, a little bit of my poetry, didn't you, and, and adapted it into your own piece mm -hmm. for um, a thing you did for Braden and, and uh, to do with, was it college or school? Um, and um, it, it, it had me in tears. There's not many people that can do what I do to, to, to most, which is, you know, I get people emotional with my poetry, but um, Bailey is one of the few people that has the ability to do that with the way she writes and her voice is just incredible. So yeah, well, that's my tribute to you. you. Thank you. I actually, I asked the question earlier about, um, I guess, giving people grace when they're not so kind. Because mm -hmm. I've been with Brayden when people were impatient with him. Yeah, it must be tough for you. Well, I had to sit there. We were at a movie theater one time, I can remember. And, and I had to tell myself that she just didn't know. She, mm -hmm. Someone had yelled at him because uh, he was standing in their way. He's tiny. And yeah. I saw his eyes get so like just watery and he walked over to me he said what did I do wrong and I was like oh like fume I want she didn't know but I wanted to educate her in a not nice way yeah uh, in that moment how so, old is Brayden now how old is he um he's 10 now so 10, yeah god yes yeah but uh yeah the project was like an anti-bias project it was uh 
we had to keep note of every time we had a bias against someone, whether it was age, weight, race, disability, all kinds of things. And, and that moment was something that made me see a lot because people jump to judgment pretty quick. And the beauty that blindness brings. Yeah, that was it. So mm -hmm. I guess being able to see people for who they really are rather than what you see. So can I ask you a question? So with regards to everything that's going on at the moment uh, with, you know, lockdown and, and the pandemic, how is that um, affecting you and how is it affecting Braden? Um, you know, how are you guys sort of coping at the moment? Well, um, he hasn't been able to get services through school. Um, so his, a lot of the education stuff that he's been doing, you can't do that online. He can't really have his specialist come out and practice learning Braille, which he's, he's doing pretty good. And um, they just don't get out much. So he hasn't been using his cane yet. So I'm kind of worried for when everything goes back. I, cause he was getting so good at it and he'll, yeah. uh, we went on a ski trip actually. And he was uh, using his cane and there's so, so many people and I was just so proud of him. But, uh, yeah, he hasn't gotten to practice much for sure. And I haven't been able to go see them. So it's kind of like riding a bike. I'm, I'm sure he will, you know, I think it's going to take society generally to, you know, there's going to take a bit of time for everyone to kind of get back to normal. I had the conversation only uh, a couple of weeks ago. My guide dog, Christopher, is not being worked at all at the moment. Um, and so I, all, all guide dog users here in the UK you know, there's not a lot of them that are out using the guide dogs. Guide dogs don't know how to socially distance, you know, stay two weeks apart. They're not trained for that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, my guide dogs, he's proper reverted now to being almost like a pet. He's sleeping on my stepson Harvey's bed at nighttime. Um, he's, you know, he's been, he's been, he's turned into a sulky teenager. So he's going to have to, um, and, and myself as well, you know, once we do come out and things start to get back to normal, we're all going to have to kind of adapt a little bit but we'll get there we'll get there like everything mm -hmm. thank you so much bailey i yeah. wanted to say if any, anyone else here wants to join talk to dave uh send in a question q a through the chat raise your hand whatever you are comfortable with we are happy to accommodate so um no one no one you will not no one will bite you Absolutely. No, the more, the more the merrier. And kind of, you know, coming back to um, what, what we were talking about before with my story, the way things kind of happen and, and snowballed. I mean, I was only meant to be out in, in the States, literally, was it a week before we went into lockdown here? Um, I, I, for those of you that don't know, I was um, honoured to be asked to be the host of this year's uh, annual Helen Keller Achievement Awards. In um, in Arlington, in in in, uh, in in Washington, and or Arlington, Virginia, I should say. That's right, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so kind of everything sort of changed. You know, events have been cancelled, and we've been, we've kind of got to go in to this sort of uh, these Zoom classes and and online webinars are, are really the the greatest tool. We're so lucky that we have you know social media and and tools like this to be able to connect with 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 friends and loved ones um, in these uh, uncertain times. And uh, it's so nice being able to see a lot of the positive ways that social media is being used at the moment, because normally it gets a little bit of a bad rep. Uh, but, um, but at the moment, I think a lot of people are using it. And those of us that are lucky to be isolated with our families, uh, I think it's, it's nice to appreciate the times that we've got with our children that we may not necessarily normally have with our loved ones. But I've always said as well, and I put, put this out from me, my page and anyone out there who knows me uh, will know that I mean this in a very sincere way. If there's anyone out there that is isolated and alone and wants to talk uh, with someone who understands, please message me anytime and I will message you right back. And there is people who are listening now who can testify that I will do that um, because I do that with a lot of people and that's how, you know, um, I connect. So, yeah. Okay. If anyone has any questions, want to raise their hand, come in, please let us know. And we'd love to have you come in. I have another question, actually. Of course. Um, 
else? Is there anything that you know now that you wish you would have known six years ago when you were diagnosed? If you could tell, go back and tell yourself anything. I suppose, you know, what, as I kind of said before, what I've, what I've learned most is to not be too hard on myself uh, because it's those, it's those days, you know, when I'm, and I still get it now, um, where I'll, my eyes will be, um, not so great because of, could be many different things. Maybe I'm run down, uh, uh, maybe I'm ill, maybe the weather's not great. Um, or, you know, I'm tired. It's, there's a lot of things that come into to factors of how my vision actually is. And when I have those bad eye days, as, as a lot of us call them, I tend to sort of break glasses or bump into things and knock things over. I did it the other week. I was, um, it was a Sunday. I cooked like a, a, a breakfast, like bacon and sausages and things for, um, for the family. And I, I cooked it all because I do all the cooking, most of the cooking in the house, I'll do it. Cause my wife says, you know, cause I enjoy cooking. If um, I can still do it and I'm independent, um, do it as long as you can do. So I, I try and push myself to do all these kind of things. That's why I do the bedtime stories with Austin. While I can still read books, I'm going to read every night of them. So um, I was cooking the breakfast. My eyes weren't great. I got Amy to help me dish up. I put stuff on the table. I poured myself like a pint of like fresh orange juice. I sat down while she was kind of dishing up and went to reach for something and then knocked a full glass of orange juice over the table and over Austin's food that I just made for him. And I got like upset with myself and frustrated. And it's natural to have these things. We all, whether you're living with disability or not, we all have bad days. And some, the, what, what makes these bad days worse is when we are hard on ourselves and we get frustrated. So I've learned, um, and if I could go back six years at your question, you know, I've learned to kind of take a step back when I'm having these days and sort of say, okay, this is normal. It's natural to feel that way. I'm not a freak for feeling anxious or depressed. There's nothing wrong with me. It's just absolutely natural and normal to be feeling this and it's not going to last. And if you know these things aren't going to last, then, you know, you can just kind of ride it out. And if you need to shut yourself away for a few hours or a morning or an afternoon and, and, and get yourself sorted out and watch some Netflix or listen to some music or do whatever it takes to, you know, to relax you, do it and then come back out. But just don't, you know, there's, this, there's a term that's used within the blind community, which I hate to a certain degree. Uh, hate's a strong word, but I'll, I'll put it on this one. I hate the word pity party. Um, because I, I think it's okay to feel sorry uh, and feel down as long as you don't stay there. Um, it's perfectly natural um, to feel anxious and get down, but, um, but just don't stay there. So um, I, I think that's, that's the best advice I give is it's just, you know, it's, it's that not being too hard on yourself. I, I, I honestly think that the hardest part of living with low vision is not necessarily the physical aspects of how you see with sight loss or how you don't see with sight loss. It's actually the misconceptions that are out there and those times where we get frustrated with ourselves. So if we can take care of those things as much as we can by raising more awareness and education and not being too hard on ourselves, things get easier. Hope that answers it, Bailey. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. You're welcome. I hope so we have to a... come to Houston soon. <laughs> well, yeah, I did this. We, we, I, I was supposed to be there in the summer, um, but that's kind of, you know, all been postponed. But uh, Barry is the man. As soon as um, it's safe to do so, uh, we will be back up and running. And, you know, as I said, we're, we're still doing all these things now. So uh, we're trying to make sure we're still connecting with people and helping and supporting people any way we can. Thank you, Bailey. I have um, uh, just uh, Sharon here wanted to know um, the the poem that you start off with, the one that you've created um, in the early days of COVID nineteen. She's asking us where can she find that, and I think is that it's on it's on your face it's on Facebook, correct? Yeah, I put it on the, the word. It's on my Facebook pages. I'm sure we can do something uh, and put it onto like the website or yeah. Um, I think yeah, we'll 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 put we'll put some links out on the on this because yep. once this once this is finished as well, this will go live on Facebook. Well, go, well, this will get posted uh, on onto Facebook for people to be able to watch 
at a later date. So I'm sure we can put it on the uh, the envision uh, the envisions page and um, sorry the insight page and 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 the standby me RP page and blind poet page and, and so forth. Yeah. Um, another uh, person wants to know what it says on your on your sweatshirt. Um, it has BP the blind poet uh, brigade logo together with Dave Steele Dave's signature. So. That is that. And yeah, we have a whole, whole range of merchandise that Barry created, uh, which is available uh, on the website, um, theblindpoet.net. If anyone wants to have a look there and get some books or a T-shirt, like... Uh, I'm just reading here. Like it's wearing, so. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just reading here. Um, hold on one second. Anyone else want to join and come in? You know, we're getting we're just a little over the, the one hour so if anyone else um, wants to come in has anything to say to share please you know please raise your hand there's a button at the bottom that just says raise my hand and uh, we'd love to bring you in in the meantime Dave is there anything else that you would like to share with this amazing audience today uh, I can share some more poetry absolutely um, let me see if we can find one in fact, yeah, I don't want to read. Just one second, I'll pull up for you now. I have all my technology and everything set up here. I have written over 700 poems in five years, uh, but I don't remember them all. Um, so for the ones I don't, I uh, have this. Okay, so um, I hope you can relate to this one. Um, let us know in the comments if you can what you think of this uh, I've read this a few times I've not read it actually as part of my tour in America um, but I will be reading this more because I think this is a one of my best it goes like this don't take your sight for granted the things that you can see life's beauty feel in memory seal consume them carefully the smiles of those who love you that look within their eyes each frame hold on for soon may come the day it shrinks in size for I know how important this little left I've got. I'm thankful for the sight I have, won't dwell on what I've not. Tomorrow's sight uncertain, no promise of our cure. So I will love and cherish these gifts today for sure. I'm hooked on vision's beauty. I'm lucky for its grace. I soak in every detail upon my true love's face. For soon that blurred tomorrow will finally be here. So I won't blink whilst on the brink this blindness I won't fear. Although sometimes I worry for days when sight is gone, I know that when the time arrives, this life will carry on. I'm an expert at adjusting. I've been doing it for years. I've learned to breathe while I still grieve. I've learned to own my fears. I'm stronger than I thought. I'm braver than you think. For I have saved my life before when stood there on the brink. I wonder though sometimes if my heart is growing numb. These days I don't feel half as much for what is still to come. It flows like waves in ocean, like sudden change in tide. I sit here writing words for you whilst from outside world I hide. But I have made a promise that I won't stay here long. For even in the darkest times I know that I am strong. My battles with depression, these anxious feelings shake. I try to find new ways to win from the moment I awake. But you won't see me failing. I'll just try and try again. For through these words, my thoughts are heard by hand of poet's pen. There you go. Thank you. And I kind of touched on a lot of the stuff we were talking about there as well, the learning to breathe while you still grieve. And yeah, I, I, it's what I have to kind of remind myself with these poems. And, you know, a lot of the ones I've been reading recently, especially from the first book, um, I've not read since I probably wrote them back in like 2015, 2016. And um, all these poems were written, you know, I lived and breathed every single word of these things. I'm not making them up. This is how I felt at the time. All the stuff that I was going through, a lot of them, you know, a lot of the darker ones were kind of um, written in my bedroom just across from where I am now um, with the curtains drawn, feeling quite anxious. And I'd just get my phone out and write. And, um, but I always, no matter how dark I was going and, and how I was talking about these bad eye days, I'd always start a poem with talking about that but then put a positive twist of saying that no matter how i'm feeling i know that we can get through this and and, and and leave it like that which i think you know if you look for that it's in every single poem that i write 
Fantastic. Yeah. So if, if there are, I guess, one last call for any questions, anyone wants to come in. Um, if not, again, I want to thank uh, Christopher and Doreen from Insight and the entire community for coming out today and for joining this webinar. And I hope everyone enjoyed. Thank you, Dave, for your time. And um, wish everyone good health. Have I got time to read one more? Go for it. Okay, I'm going to read one more. I'm going to leave you with this one. This one's called Brighter Days, and it kind of explains just that. I used to feel a panic as blindness filled my eyes. I felt so isolated, the victim of RP's lies. But even through the sorry, but even through my vision, sorry, but even though my vision will soon be thing of past tense, through your so through blur and haze, I've brighter days and newfound confidence. I've thought for inde I've fought for independence with shield and long white cane. I've lost some so-called family, but true loved ones now remain. My mm. scars ain't, ain't yet done healing. I've a feeling there'll be more. But I won't lose my purpose, no, no matter what's in store. I sparkle, maybe fading, feel I'm cramming beauty in. With memories clear, no need to fear, for RP cannot win. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So again, thank you very much for everyone who attended today. We appreciate coming out, and we hope you enjoyed. And I promise you that as soon as COVID-19 disappears and Dave is able to get back on our plane, I promise you we will be bringing him back to the USA, continuing on with the next chapter, with the next round of book tours, the next round of meetings. and Poss just Possibly a new book as well, and the children's books and all sorts. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot in store, but uh, the show must go on. So wishing everyone good health, and we'll see you. Take care. Okay. Thank you, Christopher. Thank, Thank you, Doreen. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Very Take very care, Bailey. Take care, guys. Take care. Thank, Thank you. you Dave. Be well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye, -bye.